shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Hello again. We're continuing our study of the kingdom of God. Today, we're going to take a look at the women in the body of Christ. Hello again. We're going to continue our study on the kingdom of God, the government of God, and today we're going to be talking about women in the body of Christ. Now, in the body of Christ, many things that are true in heaven are represented here on earth. The body of Christ is not a temporal entity, an entity of time and space that hopes to have an eternal future. The body of Christ, in fact, is eternal in time, and as such, God's intention for the body of Christ is to acquaint us with heavenly things while we are here. One of the great heavenly things that God wants us to become aware of is that there is a lack of competition among the personages of the Godhead. Scripture presents to us the Godhead in the form of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the presentation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we begin to see attributes or roles that are associated with each one. The mysteries of heaven are revealed in such a way that we can see them and we can comprehend them, but it's highly unlikely that we will truly, fully understand them because they are mysteries. 1 Corinthians puts it this way. In chapter 13, verse 12, it says, Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now, one of the reasons that God doesn't tell us everything is because we have no ability to fully understand all that God might want to tell us. So, there are mysteries about heaven that we really do not understand. Nevertheless, they are true. We are touching them. We're experiencing them, but we have no explanation for them. One day, however, we will be given the explanation. It's not that God's keeping things secret from us. It's because we have a limited ability to understand everything. It is important for us to remember that it is His pleasure to show us His kingdom, to give it to us, and to endow us with it. One of the more difficult tasks for the body of Christ is to see as God sees. One of the reasons it's so hard is because God never looks at things from a per competitive perspective. He doesn't view things competitively because He's God. And who's, who can contend with God? The Father sent the Son, Jesus, so that the Son, Jesus, might be glorified in the will of the Father. The Son came so that He might glorify the Father. Upon His return, the Son, Jesus, sent Holy Spirit, the mighty Holy Spirit who brooded over the face of the unformed deep as God spoke from heaven and created all that we know as the creation. It's always been the intention of God to serve. Holy Spirit comes to serve Jesus. Jesus comes to serve the Father. The Father in turn glorifies the Son and the Son, Jesus, glorifies Holy Spirit. In fact, He makes it very abundantly clear that He will not forgive anyone who transgresses the sacred character and nature of Holy Spirit. We have so much to learn from our living God. But before I move on, 
I want to ask you a question. Do you know your place in the body of Christ? Do you know where and how you were called to serve? If your answer is no, then I pray that you would ask God to show you where to serve, who to serve, and how to serve, and how to serve well. If you do know your place in Him, then I'll ask you a question slightly different. Are you flowing in it, or are you stagnant? This is not a selfish race. If you look at a natural race, people are always running. And everybody's running in their own lane. No one's jumping on top of another or purposely tripping somebody. Remember, everybody's trying to finish and to finish the race well. It's the same way in the kingdom of God. We all have our place in the body of Christ. And we all have our own area of calling. There's no room for competition, for jealousy, for strife, for division, for unforgiveness, bitterness, contention, or even vainglory. These are the things that would disqualify us. That's why Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, warns and instructs us to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of malicious behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, just as God through Jesus has forgiven you. We all need forgiveness. We all need mercy. And we all need to be able to extend it to those with whom we work. Remember, we are one. We are a team. Another thing that we have to watch out for is the enemy's tactics of pitting us against each other or having us compare ourselves to each other while we serve. This is a danger zone. I'm, remember, I'm remembered of what Paul said when he was talking to God's church in Corinthians. And he does it in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6 and 8 and 9, where he says, who is Apollos and who is Paul? That we should cause such quarrels? Why, we are only servants. Through us, God caused you to believe. Each of us did the work that the Lord gave us. My job was to plant the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God, not we, who made it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters works as a team with the same purpose. Yet they will be rewarded individually according to their own hard work. We work together as partners who belong with God. So do you see it? Do you see that there's no need for competition? Each person has their own part to play. When we do what we're called to do and we do it together, God brings forth the increase in other people's lives for His glory. This is unity. But what happens then? Because we work in unity and because it's for His glory, He rewards us individually for our part. But unfortunately, too often we approach biblical things competitively and from a worldly perspective. And when we do, we're on the wrong path. Now here's a few questions for you to ponder. May women be apostles? May women be prophets? May women be evangelists, pastors, or teachers? Now, there is a distinction in Scripture between doing the work and being in the office. And here we're talking about the five-fold ministry offices. The difference is that there is governments and there are helps. May a woman do the work of an apostle? Definitely. May a woman do the work of a prophet? Sure. 
May a woman do the work of a pastor. Yeah. Can she do the work of an evangelist? Hopefully she's out there doing it. And can a woman do the work of a teacher? Yes. But may a woman be an apostle, be a prophet, be an evangelist, be a pastor, or be a teacher? Unfortunately, no. And the reason is because there's a distinction between governments and helps. A woman may, like any other member of the body of Christ, regardless of sex, they may do the work of an evangelist or an apostle or a prophet because the equipping that you receive enables you to function. But it's to function within the measure of your own calling. The distinction between function and role is a distinction between government and helps. Governments carry an anointing that is blessed with impartation. In other words, there's a weight that's put on these people so that when they walk in the government position, there's a weight that's put on them that is not put on you when you're doing the work. So now you're beginning to see the difference and the calling of the fivefold ministry. Remember, they're to equip the church to do the work. And they do it through impartation. So as we move on, we begin to understand that when you're part of the government, when you're part of this fivefold ministry, you're blessed with the impartation. This is the difference, the primary difference between the spiritual gifts and the calling. The people gift to the body of Christ, otherwise known as the fivefold ministries. Now, if God chose to impart through a woman the role of an apostle, hey, he's God, I got no problem with it. The thing is, God didn't choose to do that. And there is a reason why. In his kingdom, heavenly things are mirrored by earthly counterparts. The woman, in the concept of heavenly things, woman represents the body of Christ. And the man represents her husband, Jesus. If you view the matter competitively, you'll run to Galatians 3.26 and you'll say that we're all sons of God because the verse says you were all sons of God through the faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you were all one in Christ Jesus. If you belonged to Christ, you were then Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the typical argument that's made is we're all sons. There's neither male nor female. So if a man can be an apostle, a woman may also be an apostle. <clears throat> the problem is, not only is that an invaluable or an invalid argument, it's an improper interpretation of that particular passage. Because the appropriate question would be, are there times when God recognizes that we are male or female? Are there times when it's relevant that we are either male or female? So let's take a look. Let's examine when it is relevant that we're male or female. When the matter of our sonship to God comes into play, it is not important if you are male or female. When it comes to our inheritance, it doesn't matter, male or female. When it comes to legal issues, such as your standing before the law, it should not matter if you are male or female. 
When it comes to being compensated for light work, a woman doing the same job as a man, it shouldn't matter if you're male or female. <coughs> However, it is to deny the obvious to say that there are no times when it's just as important to recognize whether you are male or female. The adversary is waging war against God but he is restricted in his activities by the order that God has established. Because the adversary has to observe God's structures. If he doesn't, God would destroy him. The adversary must observe the rules as God has determined the rules. One of the ways in which the body of Christ resembles a heavenly paradigm is in the matter of government and order. We need government and we need order because we have an enemy who is obligated to respect God's order and honor God's government. Now, it's hard for us to imagine that Satan and everyone who works for him, the adversary, would agree to these terms. They had no choice. They had to. But what we need to remember is the order of God's government is for the benefit and the protection of those who were under his government. There's the verse, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it, upholding it with justice and righteousness, from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And that's in Isaiah 9, verse 7. When it talks about of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. It's because there is someone who may disturb your peace if God's government was not in place. Now, who would that be? So, the order that's established by God accounts for this fact that regarding the adversary, male and female are equally vulnerable. The fact that you are a male does not give you some extraordinary strength or power to resist the enemy. We're just as, as vulnerable is the woman. But the government of God when you were under the government of God there's provision that the man is empowered to act for the protection and the benefit of the woman. This is a way for God to show all humans who are all equally weak against the demonic forces how Jesus, who is typified by man, the man, the male, acts on behalf of the body of Christ, which is typified by the woman. The value of this heavenly paradigm is that it allows us to trust that we cannot be overcome by the enemy because God is for us. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You, dear, ch dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So God set up an order a form of order in which he instructs us that he will act for our benefit, for the benefit of those who put their trust in him. A man is given greater authority than a woman in dealing with the demonic. To teach mankind that Jesus, who is greater, Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, will act on our behalf. Although man is equal to woman in terms of sonship, 
in terms of the government of God, the role of man is designed to protect the woman from the attacks of the enemy. This is one time when it does matter that you are male or female. While the passage itself says that we are neither male nor female, and it's rele relevant to the concept of our sonship, it is not relevant to the question of our authority, especially the authority when it comes to the adversary. Being a son of God has no relevance to our gender, to our national origins, to our economic standings, to our position, to our status, whether we're slaves or free. Why? The answer is very simple. God is not the father of our humanity. He is the father of our spirits and our sonship in Him is to be considered apart from any attributes of our humanity. The woman in the picture of heavenly things is not just a woman. She represents the body of Christ. She represents the interest that heaven has in humanity, collectively. The adversary who opposes us is stronger than any human being. He is restrained only by the order of God's government. His resisting of that order is not the resisting of us. It is the resisting of God who set up that order. If Adam had stood between Satan and woman, the story would have come out differently. God does not put a woman in a place of authority over a man because of the adversary's attacks against that place of authority. In God's kingdom, it's the order of God that protects and defends us against the enemy. Jesus is the protector of his bride. He gave himself for her. He covered her with his blood. She is loved and protected because she is covered. Unknowingly, the ancient Jewish rabbis portrayed this when it comes to women. And it's kind of funny to me that they came up with this not really knowing what they were saying. So the phrase that they, they love to say and share amongst each other was, God has not formed woman out of the head, lest she should become proud, nor out of the eye, lest she should become lustful, nor out of the ear, lest she should become curious, nor out of the heart, lest she should become jealous, nor out of the hand, lest she should be covetous, nor out of the foot, lest she be a busybody. But she was made out of the rib, which is always covered. Women find comfort in the fact that you were covered. Now a woman who prophesies may prophesy better than a man or even be more competent in prophesying than a man. But she does not become a fivefold prophet. Hers is the operation within the realm of helps, spiritual gifts, not the gift of governments, not the place of authority, not in the fivefold ministry. It's not how you can prophesy that makes you a prophet. It's whether or not the grace for the impartation of the confidence that you can hear God, that has been given to you by God through Holy Spirit for His church. That is what makes you a prophet. That's the difference. That carries the responsibility to impart not only the confidence, but it also carries the responsibility of being corrected, and perhaps at times being corrected in public. God will not permit a woman to be corrected 
publicly, and God will not a woman to be corrected by another man. If she is to be corrected, she's to be corrected by her husband. And if she is not married, she's to be corrected by the one who has the authority to watch over her soul. Her father first, and then so on. But the thing is, when a woman is to be corrected by her husband or by the one watching over her soul, it's to be done privately. Now, with everything that I've said so far, as a foundation, that's all that was, was to establish the foundation, we're going to move on. Because scripture teaches us that both men and women are made in the image of God. And as a result, we are equal before him in terms of status, dignity, and humanity. And you can go to Genesis 1, verse 27. We also find out that they are equal co-inheritors of the promises that God made to Abraham. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Because now there is no distinction between Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, male or female. There is also no distinction made between men and women when it comes to spiritual gifts and how they are distributed. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But, it seems like there's a lot of buts in this message. But, when it comes to the teaching gifts, there are differences in how these gifts are to be used. Now, if we step back in time, we will find that Jesus' attitude towards women was revolutionary for his day. And he clearly upheld the equality between men and women. He spoke to women in public. He commended them for the companionship and their service. He taught them and he commended Mary for making his teaching a priority when the other responsibilities might have distracted her from listening to him. In the Gospels, women are the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection and they were told to tell others what they had seen. Find this in Matthew 28, 7, Mark 16, 7, and John 20, 17. But here's the catch. This was unique because a woman's testimony in that time was not thought to be reliable in the legal courts. There's no doubt that Jesus highly valued the ministry of women. And like Paul, he commended them for their service of the gospel. Here's another but. Jesus did not appoint women as his apostles. A unique foundational role that has been reserved for men. And Paul never appointed women to be overall leaders of the local church. Women, however, have a unique contribution to make to the life of the local church but it's not the same as for men. Why, when so much of his treatment of women was revolutionary for his day, why did Jesus not introduce identical roles for men and women in the local church? In our day, it's incredible that the equality of status doesn't automatically mean equality of function. The answer to this question lies at the very heart of the Godhead itself. In the Trinity, we see a pattern of relationships that shows how it's possible for equality of being to coexist 
with diversity of function. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are equal in status, but each has a different function. Moreover, there's a definite ordering of their relationship. God the Son submits himself to his Father's will. God Holy Spirit submits both to the Father's will and to the Son's will. In this pattern of relationship that is desired, that God desires that we model this type of relationship in family life and in the, our life in the church family as God orders his creation to reflect the ordering of the relationships within the Godhead. And that's in 1 Corinthians 11.3. Because of the order and the purpose of their creation, wives are to submit to their husbands in everything in recognition of the fact that the husbands are the head of the family, just as Jesus is the head of the church. Now, women hate that term, submit. I had someone explain to me once, submission is nothing more than self-control of your own power. Something for you all to think about. But I know that that's a touchy subject for a lot of women. Because they tend to forget the next part. Where husbands are to love their wives just as Jesus loves the church. And he gave himself up for her. Men, we need to step up. We need to deny ourselves so that we can lift our wives up. This is the way that God has ordered their relationships with each other. And the Christian marriage cannot function very well without it. Yet, this does not mean that husband and wives are equal. Each of them needs the other to play their part in marriage. And the marriage is to reflect the way that Jesus relates to his bride, the church. When it comes to roles within the church family, the same pattern of relationship applies. Because of the order and purpose of their creation, men are to have leadership responsibilities that women do not share. It's not appropriate for women to teach or have authority over men. 1 Timothy 2, 11-13 Although it is completely appropriate for a woman to teach and train other women. Titus 2, 3-5 In fact, there's a role here that is uniquely a woman's role. Men can teach scripture to women, but they cannot always model it for them. The areas needing to be modeled effectively constitute three different spheres of life. The first, relationships within family. The second, involves purity and self-control, and the third involves the whole area of work. Men are needed to model to other men what it means to be godly in these areas, but only a woman can model to women what it means to be a godly woman. The complementary aspect of men and women in ministry is important as it is for husbands and wives. Each needs to do their part in marriage and in ministry. Only then will the people of God be properly pastored by the Word of God. Now it's encouraging to see how the expressions uh, of the church are beginning to recognize this and they're actually employing women to their staff teams to teach and to train women. An all-male church team is in danger of limiting the effectiveness of their ministry 
because they cannot adequately model how to live in a godly way to women. In the same way that a family works well with both parents taking responsibility for the teaching and the training of their children, it's important that the church family has men and women involved in the teaching and the training of their congregations within the parameters established in Scripture. Now, the highest measure of a church life and health is Christ-likeness. When we talk about the life and health of a church, we aren't talking about its size, its programs, or its leadership. These may be indicators of a church's life and health, but it is not its foundation. Paul says a healthy church body is unified in faith and in the knowledge of Christ, both of which causes the church to reflect Jesus in increasing measure, which is the goal. Christ-likeness is attained as men and women do the work of ministry. So how does God bring about Christ-likeness within His church? Partly through spiritual gifts within its congregation. God can use imperfect, flawed, undeserving people, both men and women, alike for ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. All of our very gifts and efforts in serving and building up the church, strive towards God's goal of Christ-likeness. So knowing these truths, what are the unique and the varied ways that women may contribute to the life and health of the church? What are some of the facets of their work of ministry that build up the church towards the goal of Christ-likeness? I have a disclaimer. All of the following points could apply to men as well, except the first one. Women are particularly gifted in these eight areas. Okay, men, this is the one that does not apply to us because there's no way that this is going to happen. Childbearing. The fact must be recognized that women literally build up the local church by adding to it through childbearing. By having children, they grow the population of the expression, ushering in tiny earthly lives that we pray will be born again in Jesus. Now someone once said, pregnancy is the ultimate in hospitality as women lay down their bodies for another human and welcome them into the world. Hospitality. Women are uniquely gifted by God to nurture and to create home. They love to include people, welcoming, welcoming them into our lives and through our doors. This doesn't mean that they're Martha Stewart. It means that they share whatever they've been given by God with others, trusting that He will use their hearts and their homes to build up His people and do the work of maturing of the church. Compassion. Women have a unique emotional capacity for care, empathy, warmth, and sensitivity. Men demonstrate compassion also not in the same context as women, especially as they minister to other women. Through their mercy, through their gentleness, and their desire to serve women's needs, they build up the church and the knowledge of Christ, who is all these things for us. Teaching. As God has called men to pastor churches to preach and teach in a specific context, He's calling women to the unique role of teaching His Word to other women. Titus 2, 3 through 5. What might this look like in a local setting? Large group Bible teaching, small group teaching, mentoring, discipling, even a cup of coffee. 
These are teaching roles that women can fill for the good of their sisters as they grasp and they enter in to the women's questions, their struggles and their joys. In this way, they can help the pastoral staff by pouring life into women. Women can be teachers, and God uses this work of ministry to build up the body of Christ in trust and in knowledge. Relationships. Whether they're introverts or extroverts, women in church tend to be relational. They naturally gravi gravitate towards people, especially other women. They invite women to church. They disciple other women. They share wisdom in the conversations through submission to God's Word. Older women are mentors and spiritual patriarchs to the younger women, while the younger women seek out older women to speak truth and wisdom into their lives. All of these relationships lead to Christ-likeness. And leadership, women bring all of the above qualities to bear within leadership roles. They head children's ministries. They direct the hospitality team. They lead service groups, and they work as church staff, among many other positions. It is because of the way that God has wired women, they bring perspective, ideas, and help for the church that men may not necessarily bring. Women add to the church's life and help as they exercise the gift of leadership in various capacities and contexts. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ is the church's goal. How will you build up the local church and help it pursue its growth and Christ-likeness? How will you do this through your, your unique gifts? Who are you in Jesus? Who are you in the body of Christ? Who is Jesus in and through you? What work of ministry is God calling you to? I'm going to close with this. Do your part and strive to work together as one in unity within the body of Christ. Philippians 2.2 says, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one heart and one purpose. We need this today. Let's serve. Let's love. Let's forgive. Ladies, show Jesus in you. Let's labor together so that someday we can hear the words in Matthew 25, 21. Where we stand before Jesus and we hear him say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. We need you, ladies. We need you to fulfill your role.